The solar system has a way of reminding us that it isn't finished giving up its secrets. Earlier this summer, astronomers announced the official discovery of a new dwarf planet, over 400 miles wide or about 700 kilometers. That's around the size of Germany and it's on an orbit that swings from the outer Kuiper Belt all the way out to over 1600 astronomical units, so far that his year lasts some 25,000 Earth years. For the moment it holds the uninspiring name of 2017 OF201, which just refers to when the possible minor planet got spotted for the first time. Now that it's been confirmed and is a probable dwarf planet like Pluto, not just a minor planet, it is likely to get something more interesting as a designator. But is it an interesting place? To the casual eye it's just another lump of ice, but to a civilization thinking in terms of megastructures and interstellar journeys, this is no mere ice ball, it's a potential way station to the stars, a seat of dozens of Earth's worth of living space, and a reminder that the crumbs of the solar system are still vast enough to feed empires. What counts as a dwarf planet? Pluto's so-called demotion in 2006 remains one of the most controversial decisions in astronomy, and to my mind one of the silliest bits of public relations in science. For nearly a century we were content with our nine planets, with Pluto the runt of the litter, yet history had already shown us how definitions evolve. In the 1800s, before Neptune and Pluto were discovered, Ceres and several of the large asteroids were hailed as planets, until the asteroid belt was recognized and a new category was needed. That's really why the third criterion for a proper planet status was introduced that a planet must dominate its orbit, sweeping away or capturing its neighbors. Otherwise we need more major planets in the asteroid belt, none of which would mass as much as our own moon. Also, once astronomers began turning up Pluto-like worlds, Eris even bigger than Pluto, and others yet unnamed, it was clear we needed another category, thus was born the dwarf planet. But to declare Pluto not a planet was clumsy, because dwarf planet is still a kind of planet just as Jupiter and Saturn are gas giants and Uranus and Neptune are ice giants. Giant or dwarf, they are all planets, and I suspect the public would have accepted the change far more warmly had that been emphasized. And in truth, the supposed emotion is unlikely to stick in the long run. As we'll see today, dwarf planets may prove to be some of the most valuable real estate in the solar system, future homes to vast civilizations who will hardly consider their worlds insignificant. Indeed, there are many of them. Pluto shares its realm with countless Kuiper Belt objects, a second, larger asteroid belt spread in a rough discus 30 to 50 AU from the Sun, but among these are dozens already acknowledged as dwarfs Eris, Wame, Makamaki, Ceres, Sedna, Gangang, Kreor, and many more, and with candidates still piling up. Each new dwarf war discovered doesn't just expand the list, it expands our imagination of the frontier. Icy or rocky, adorned with tenuous atmospheres or strange ring systems, they collectively form a kind of second solar system beyond Neptune, a hidden archipelago of resources, mysteries, and future homes waiting in the dark. But there are bodies lying even beyond the Kuiper Belt, and their vast distance from our Sun may be their greatest strength and value. The New Arrival 2017 OF201 this newly recognized dwarf planet, catalogued as 2017 OF201, travels on one of the most elongated paths known. At perihelion, it brushes the Kuiper Belt around 45 AU out. At aphelion, it soars more than 1600 AU into the dark on a 25,000 year orbit. That's longer than all of recorded human history. What makes it compelling isn't just the exotic orbit, but the sheer mass it represents. At somewhere between 500 and 900 kilometers across, it holds around 1 20,000 of Earth's mass, roughly 3 times 10 to 21 kilograms. That's a number with a large margin of uncertainty, but still, 3 billion megatons. And that is enough to build not just a few habitats, but millions of them, and in a fusion economy, enough fuel to run lighting for all of them for astronomically long periods. From Ice Ball to Megastructure if you carve up that mass into O'Neill cylinders, the classic 32 km long habitats designed by Gerard K. O'Neill that we love discussing on this show, 
and each requiring about 10,000 megatons of mass to construct, you could build about 30 million cylinders. Each of those offers around 500 square kilometers of farmland and cityscape, comparable to a typical US county in size. Put them all together and you have 24 billion square kilometers of living area, 47 Earths worth of real estate. You would likely do far less, especially at first, as composition is likely to be heavier on ices than metals and rock, with some habitats built buried deep into the ice, safe from radiation and even enemy attack. Assuming you can power them by fusion or even by beamed energy from in the solar system, you have plenty of motivation to build out this far, including for science and military purposes, as well as trade ports and interstellar relays and waypoints. So while the dwarf planet itself is a frozen wasteland, its mass could underwrite the lives of trillions. A speck of ice at the solar system's edge is secretly a treasure chest of civilization. Waypoint to the Stars The orbit of 2017 OF201 makes it far more than just a quarry. Worlds like this are natural way stations between the Sun and other stars beyond. Outbound ships could pause here for fuel, materials, or repairs. Communication relays might anchor on it, stitching together the void with laser links. With powerful enough beams, such outposts could even push vessels to higher speeds, or just as importantly, help them slow down when arriving in another system. Normally those laser sail infrastructures must cling close to their parent star, limited by distance and precision, but a chain of dwarfs could extend their reach. A network of such worlds could become a ladder into the dark, slow, deliberate, but steady progress toward the stars. And while it would still demand enormous energy, the highly eccentric orbit of this particular dwarf makes it easier to imagine turning it into a true interstellar arc. At Apelion, 16,000 AU away, the sun's escape velocity is only about 330 meters per second, roughly 740 miles per hour, similar to a jetliner. A nudge there, applied with patience, could free it entirely, though in point of fact a smaller nudge when it's closer to the sun would take less energy, using the Oberth effect, and probably be easier to apply via some powerful laser evaporating material off one side to act as a rocket plume. This does not have to be on the sun-facing side either, you can just bounce the beam off a mirror tethered to the body to hit the side you want your rocket coming from. We talked about this approach before in our comet mining episode for importing comets and Oort cloud bodies into the solar system for bringing seas and skies to the red planet. And even without fusion, within its bulk likely lie the uranium and thorium to sustain a sizable civilization during the long drift between suns. Should no swifter means of colonization arise, such wandering worlds might yet carry us across the interstellar gulf. This connects directly to our recent episode on colonizing rogue planets. Rogue worlds drifting between stars may be rare or closer to home, but in the scattered disk and Oort cloud we find a preview of the same principle. Worlds without suns, waiting to be used as habitats, relays, or refuges. The difference is that a body like 2017 OF201 still ties back to our sun, making an obvious first step in building an interstellar road. Lessons from Pluto and the Dwarf Planet Census Pluto remains the most famous dwarf planet and in some ways the postal child for this category. It reminds us that planetary identity is more about context than size. Pluto is smaller than our moon, yet it has a thin atmosphere, five moons of its own, and a heart-shaped glacier larger than Texas. One of those moons at least is a dwarf planet in its own right, and home to the Black Plains of Mordor. The tally of confirmed dwarfs continues to grow. Eris, nearly Pluto's twin size, lies far beyond Neptune. Huame spins so fast it's shaped like a football and has its own rings. Sedna follows a 12,000 year orbit that takes it into the inner Oort cloud. And now with 2017 OF201, we add another cousin one that pushes even further into the abyss. Each discovery sharpens the mystery, how many of these are out there? Likely thousands large enough to be spherical, and perhaps millions of small icy dwarfs awaiting discovery. Engineering Challenges and Opportunities Mining and colonizing a dwarf planet is no small feat. Gravity is weak, resources are locked in ice, and sunlight is faint or non-existent. Yet those same conditions make them attractive. Weak gravity means easy launches, abundant ice means water and fuel, 
and distance from the sun makes them excellent refuges for hidden bases or long-term archives. Fusion power changes everything. As I said earlier, with the supply of deuterium and helium-3, plentiful in ices, you can light up whole colonies. Buried habitats beneath the surface offer natural shielding. You could even carve O'Neill-like caverns inside the body itself before shipping mass off to orbital habitats. The dwarf plant becomes both quarry and fortress, and a potential lush habitat too. Buried under that darkness we may plant garden paradises lit by artificial suns, and safely store away vast archives of knowledge and culture where even the worst calamities or wars back here could not easily reach. Before we wrap up, I want to take a quick moment to thank our long-term supporters over on Patreon, who made this and many other short-notice bonus episodes possible, as they don't work well for traditional show sponsors. If you'd like to see more episodes like this, consider joining our Patreon. Just use the QR code or the link in the episode description. Your support helps turn ideas into episodes. And speaking of current events, this is one of three current event episodes I wrote on vacation a couple weeks back and the last one was on 3i Atlas, the new interstellar comet. We determined it to be an interstellar object because it's on a hyperbolic trajectory set to leave the solar system, and it hadn't come close to any bodies that could have given it such a nudge, as we talk about giving to our dwarf planet to make it a rogue interstellar planet. After the episode, someone asked if maybe it might have encountered an unknown planet, and as we see today, we are still finding plenty, but two problems there. First, there's not a lot of options for big gas giants to be hiding out as Planet X, because they give off an infrared glow of heat that we can see pretty well these days. That doesn't rule out a corridor body, but that makes them smaller, which affects your effective maximum speed change on a slingshot, which is related to both the orbital velocity of the planet it encounters around the Sun, which is incredibly slow the further our body is from the Sun, and also, especially for orbit earth effect bumps, the escape velocity of that planet from its surface. You would slam into it if you descended further. Small planets just don't have very high escape velocities, so some unknown Planet X wouldn't be likely to flip a local comet into a hyperbolic orbit, but it's not technically impossible either. Needless to say, such bodies also make nice platforms to hitch a ride on to another star system, but I suspect, much like our new dwarf planet, it would almost always be faster and more economical to construct a purpose-built interstellar arc. Extrapolating the Frontier 2017 OF201 is just one body, but its discovery hints at a larger truth. If one such dwarf exists, there are likely many more on similar orbits. Beyond them, the Oort Cloud may hold trillions of objects. Even if only a fraction are dwarf-sized, the cumulative mass is enormous, enough to build thousands of Earths worth of habitats. This is where astronomy meets futurism. The Milky Way may be littered with such stepping stones. Civilizations may not need to leap star to star, but crawl from dwarf to dwarf, building out infrastructure as they go. Each little world adds up to a galaxy-spanning network. So when astronomers announce the discovery of a new dwarf planet, don't just imagine a distant frozen rock. Imagine a seed for dozens of Earths worth of homes. Imagine a relay station on the way to the stars. Imagine another reminder that in space, even the small things are vast. Harbor lights in the deep, guiding us outward on the longest journey of all. And perhaps it's fitting that Pluto, once scorned as a demoted planet and its kin, will prove to be the first true gateways to the stars. Thank you for listening.